Thank you, Jesus. Well, it is an honor to, um, one, be at this church. And my wife and I are very blessed to be able to be here. It's also an honor um, to be able to preach the word of God. Um, when I was, when, when Pastor Greg had asked me to uh, preach this morning, although I had no idea they were going to present me with that Alabama jersey. For those of you that don't know, I am a Tennessee fan. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but trust me, we'll hang it up. I just don't know where, but we'll hang it up. I'm just messing. But as I was praying and asking God, you know, what do you want me to speak on this morning? This topic that has been on my mind for, oh my Lord, I can't even remember back when, um, is, is, is prayer. It's simple. It's easy. We all know to do it. We all know how to. But how many of you agree that sometimes it's the easy things that we forget? And it's the simple things that we overlook. And a lot of times in life we go through it and, you know, the words we tell ourselves is I can do it. I can handle it. I can get through through this. The problem with all that is I. You can't because we can't without God helping us, without prayer, without him intervening into our lives and saying, you know what, I've got that. We have to pray. Prayer has to become a priority in our, our, our life. We're going to read this morning out of Acts, if you'll stand, Acts chapter 4. We're going to go verse 23 through 31. To give you some context on the passage today, Peter and John had just prayed for and healed a lame man. Much to the dislike of people that were there, all of you, the leaders of the, the, the time. So they arrested him. They put him in jail. And, and they even said it was around verse 19, 20, that, that, that they wanted to keep him longer. But when they talked about it, they had no reason to because they didn't find fault in what he had done. So they let him go. And this is where we come into Acts 4 right here, verse number 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to, to them. They went back and told them what had happened. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer. How many of you know that it could have been real easy for them to get mad and argue and complain? And they could have grouped together and said, we're going to get back at them. They could have grouped together and tried to devise a plan that said, we're going to show them who's boss. I would know what's right. They could, have, they, they could have gotten angry. But instead of all of that, they gathered together and they prayed. And this is what they prayed. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, Consider their threats and enable your servants, I love this, to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And the best part of this all, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and the, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. After they prayed in response to their prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we just ask you to be in this place this morning. We ask you, God, that your Holy Spirit, that your presence would just fall in this place, God. Lord, let whatever is said be not words from my mouth, God, but they be words directly from you. Be with me as I speak this morning. Open up ears, open up eyes, and open up minds to know, to hear, and to see what you want us to. In your precious and most heavenly name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. You can have a seat. We're going to be talking about the purpose of, of prayer, but before we kind of get into all that, how, how many of you know how easy it is to get out of shape? Come on now, I should have seen all the hands go up. How many of you know how easy it is to get out of shape? You, you know why? Because I like food. Does, is there anybody else in here that likes food? Am I the only one? I like, for some reason, I don't know why, but I like to go, you know, to, to uh, there's a couple of fast food places that I like, you know, Chick-fil-A and Wendy's. And, but there's this sandwich at Wendy's that I just, I can't get anything else but that. It's like it's so good, you know what I mean? And it's the most unhealthy thing you could ever eat. 
And just looking at it, I'd probably gain some pounds. But I like it so much. But how, how many of you know that, that I can't eat whatever I want and not exercise and expect to lose weight? You know, here's what, and I'm going to brag just a tad bit, because on January 3rd of this year, I was 280 pounds. And I decided that this year's New Year's res- 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 resolution was not going to be like once in the past where I said, you know, I'm going to lose weight. And then day one came and I said, I'll wait till tomorrow. So I said, I'm just going to do it. So I've lost a, a lot of weight, but it's due to the fact that you have to exercise. You have to do it because I know that if I want to lose weight, that even if I eat whatever I want, I still have to run or jog or lift weights or do whatnot so that I can be in shape. The problem is sometimes if it's not a habit, if it's not something that we do every day, we eat and then we wake up, we say, I'm going to exercise, do it one day. Hey, that's great. Go the next day we eat and day two comes and you're like, man, I'm so tired. I really don't want to do this. Because how, how many of you know that if you, if you don't get into the routine of actually doing it, it's hard to do? The same way with the church. Can we really expect to be in good shape if we don't practice what we preach? Can we really expect to be in good shape if we don't practice our faith? Can we really expect to be in good shape if we don't pray? Because if we don't make it a habit, if we don't do it every single day, the Bible tells, says that men ought always to pray. If we don't make it a habit of something, you know what? A lot of us say, and I was just talking to somebody about this this morning. They say, well, I just don't have time. You always have time. You can make time. You can make time when you're driving in your car. There's always time to pray. Because let me tell you something. This isn't even my note. Let me tell you, if you do not pray, then the fullness of God's blessings will not rest on you. And I'm going to be completely honest. We have to make it a habit every single day we've got to pray. The, the word tells me in James that faith by itself, if it's not with action, is what? It is dead, which, means, which tells me that I can believe all day long that I can be healed. I can believe that I can be restored. I can believe that I can overcome whatever the enemy throws at me. But where is the action? If I don't put any action behind it, then my faith is dead. I might believe that I can be a professional athlete, but unless I train like one, I can believe that this church can reach 800, and it can, but if we don't get outside the walls of this church and go and reach out and love on people, then it's not going to happen. We have to put action behind our faith. We have to pray. There's a lot of times that my son will ask me, he he says, you know, he, for some reason, I don't know if you guys had kids like this, my oldest son is four, my youngest is two. Well, my two-year-old will eat anything in sight. You lay it there and it's gone. Now, my my four-year-old is picky, and he likes candy. And he thinks that I'll just let him eat it whenever he wants candy. And there's a lot of times where he'll say, Daddy, 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 I really want this candy. Son, I really want you to have it too, but I need you to eat first. Don't you think that there's sometimes we pray to God? And we get mad at him because our prayers don't get answered. But he says, you know what, son, I really do want you to be healed. But first, I need you to pray. Son, I really know that you need that money, and and I will give that to you. But first, I I need you to fast. There's things that we need to do to back up our faith so that God can come through for us. Sometimes we pray to him, and we just get mad at him. We, 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 We just get upset. You know, God, why isn't this happening right now? Has, any, has, has anybody ever been there where you question, you know, God, I want this right now. And then it don't happen. Because, because and we all know this, it is a simple truth, but we forget it's not in our time. God does it in his time. There's a church up in New York, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. And um, the pastor, when he first went there, he wasn't even a pastor. He was a basketball player and he was a coach. But he, had, but he had heard the call of God on his, on, on his life. He knew that he was going to preach. So his wife's dad called him up one day and said, I have a church up in New, New, up in New York. Would, would you like to take it? Sure, you know, I know I'm called to preach. I'll go up there. This church had about five people in it. He said the first offering they had was like a dollar. And he would pray and pray and pray and just seemed like nothing was going right. 
Church wasn't growing. People were upset. People were mad. He got so stressed out that he made himself sick. I've been there before where I've been bogged down with stuff. I've gotten so stressed out that I've just made myself ill. So here's what he did. He decided, you know what? I need to take a break. I'm going to step back. I'm going to step away. I'm going to go down to Florida. I'm going to get on a boat. I'm going to go out there and fish. I'm going to go on a cruise. So he did. So he left. He went down there. He told his church, guys, just give me just a couple of weeks. Let me hear from God. Mind you, he was frustrated because his church could never grow. His church was not growing. So he got down there and he was on the boat and, and he started praying. And, and it, it says in his book, it says that he woke up one morning, got out on the boat, got to the front of the boat, and he just looked at all of God's creation. Just looked at how awesome it was. And he said, God, I need you right now. I don't know where to go, don't know what to do, don't know what to say. Don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. The church is going under. If, I, if something don't happen, we're going to have to close up the walls of this church. He got to that point. And he prayed and he prayed. And it says in, in, in his book that he heard the audible voice of God. It's in his prayer, he heard God speak in, 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 into him. And he said, Jim, he said, if you make prayer a priority, there will never be a building large enough to contain the people that I will send. If you make prayer a priority. So he left and he went back to his church. He created a prayer service. They, they did this prayer service on, on uh, Tuesday nights, right? Is that when they did it? Tuesday nights. Okay, this church is reaching thousands of people. They were at the point where they were about to close the doors of the church. And he said that I've got to have God. I've got to pray. I've got to hear from him. So here's what happened. Because he prayed, because he heard from God, because he acted on what he heard, then God blessed it. He acted. There was action behind his faith. He knew that God could, but he knew that he had to do something about it. So he prayed. We cannot allow the walls of this church to limit our mission. There are people out there in Northport in the surrounding areas that need Jesus Christ. And we have to be willing to step outside the doors of the church and go find them and bring them here. This is a place of worship. But the ministry is out there. And we have to get out there and do that. Prayer brings us into the presence of God. And it's in his presence where life change happens. You begin to desire the things that he desires. Love the things that he loves. Change the things he wants you to change. The best types of prayers are honest, humble, and transparent. God knows what we go through. And this is what sometimes stinks about life, but it's just, you know, the truth. Sometimes we have to hit rock bottom for us to realize that we need God. We have to hit the lowest of lows. Where it seems like everything has just crashed down. And nothing will ever go good. We have to hit that point to realize we cannot do it on our own. We have to have God. But do you know what I, do you know what I like about being there? It's because you know when, when, when you're there that God's got it. That he takes his arms and he wraps them around you. And he says, my child, I've got this. Just let me do it. If we can let go and let God, you've heard the phrase, if we can let go and let God do it, he can come through. We have to realize that when we're going through this hard time, he's not doing this to us, but rather he's doing this for us. You see, that's a hard concept to grasp. We, we, we want to say, God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I sick? Why am I like this? Why don't I have the money to pay these bills? Why am I so depressed? Why am I stressed out? Why are you doing this to me? God's not doing it to you. He's doing it for you because sometimes God's got to take you through a mess in order to give you a message. Some, sometimes God's got to take you to a place where you can only trust in him to, so that you can know. that. And so when he, he does bring you out of it, it wasn't you that did that, but it was God that brought you out of it. Amen. Same thing happened when Paul and Silas were locked up in jail. They were locked up in jail. And what happened? They prayed. And when they prayed, the jail shook. The doors came open. And they were released. So much so that he was even able to lead the guard to a lifestyle of, with, with 
Christ. God opened up that door for him inside of the jail cell to reach somebody. Because what happens is when you pray and when you act on your faith, God does miracles. That's why I love Paul. Paul teaches us how to pray. When he spoke to the church in Ephesus, this is what he said in Ephesians 3. For this reason I kneel before the Father. Now let me stop there for a second because, you know, the Bible never said exactly, but we, we do know that he was locked up to a guard. He was chained to a guard. And I could just sit here and imagine what that guard must have been thinking when Paul knelt down to pray. Because the word, the word here is, 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 is confined, which means that he was strapped to him. So I, I, I can only think, the only picture in my head tells me that when Paul knelt down, the guard had to kneel down with him. He showed him there how to pray. This is what it says. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth, and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts and through your faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think, according to his power that is at work in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. In, in, in these verses, Paul teaches us something about prayer. He says that, number one, you have to be sincere in your prayer. You have to be real. God already knows what you're going through. You just have to admit it to him. Be sincere with your prayer. He wasn't praying out of obligation because he had to. He in his heart just wanted the people there to know that God could bless you. Number two, you have to be personal. Paul's prayer was effective because it was 100% personal. He didn't get it from a book. It came from his heart. You have to be respectful. Paul wanted those in Ephesus to never forget how awesome and powerful God was. Highlighting verse 20 that says, Now to him who is able to do more than what you ask or think. God can give you more than what you deserve. And then you have to submit to God. See, the problem with submission is we are microwave Christians in the fact that we want things to happen right now. We have to be patient and yield to the fact that it's not my will, but it's his will. Prayer has to be a priority. The problem is, is that today it's not a normal part of our life, one, and it's not a normal part of this world. We live in a culture today that, that tells you it's not okay to pray, or you can't pray out loud. You can't talk about God. And if there's any time to pray, it's right now. If we don't pray, then our relationship with Jesus hurts. The life of Christ in us, which is nourished not by food, but by prayer, hurts. When a person is born again from above, the life of Jesus Christ is born in him, and he can either starve or nourish that life. Prayer is the way that the life of God in us is nourished. We look upon prayer simply sometimes as a means of getting things for ourselves, when in reality what prayer really is is getting to know God more, getting to know him on an intimate level. Prayer has many purposes, but the most important one is that it allows us to be in communion with him. When you're in love with somebody, all you want to do is just talk to them. When you're really in love with somebody, I love my wife more than, any, more than anything in this whole world. I love just sitting down to talk with her. Our relationship with God has to be the same way where you cannot go a day in your life without talking to him. When you really truly love God that much, then you're willing to take 10 minutes out of your day and pray. Prayer allows us to hear the voice of God and receive direction and correction that will enable us to become powerful. The problem is we don't like correction. When the correction comes, we get prideful. And we say, I'm, I'm fine. 
But see, we pray all the time and we ask God, you know, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? Open up a door in my life in order to minister. God, I just want to be used of, of you. And then it just seems like that direction just never comes. And that's because sometimes the actual direction won't come until the correction takes place. God needs something in our heart to be changed. We, we learned about it this past week about the iron in your heart. If you, if you, were, here, if you were here at camp meeting, okay, Pastor Troy talked about bringing that iron up to the top of your heart and we have to give God everything that we have. There isn't a single part of your heart that God already doesn't know about. He knows it's there. He's just waiting on you to give it to Him. We have to lay down our pride and allow God be God. Prayer brings us into obedience with the Word of God. As He said, men ought always to pray. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is the responsibility, the requirement of all of us. He has given us the responsibility to pray for our leaders. And if there's any time and day that we need to pray for our presidents, it's right now. Prayer is our responsibility. Prayer gives us the authority to change the circumstances around us. Because when we allow God in control, God can change those things. Prayer heals Prayer takes away our brokenness. Prayer restores us. You see, back in 2002, I was a sophomore in high school. And um, I had just gotten over a, a really bad case of strep throat. And I had gotten uh, over it enough to be able to go on a youth trip. So we took this youth trip down to Orlando. And down in Orlando, they have a hard rock They have a hard rock camp cafe there between islands of adventure and universal i won't ever eat there again because i had some fish and apparently there was a bone inside the fish and because i wasn't all the way over my strep throat the bone cut the back side of my throat and the strep got into my bloodstream i got really sick one Sunday morning, see, I'm, I, I am a pastor's kid, so I mean, I loved church. I loved it. I never missed church. Every time the doors were open, I was there. But this particular Sunday morning, I could not go. Bent over in pain. Mom and dad went to church. They came back. I'm still bent over in pain. Mom, I got to go to the ER. Something's not right. We go to the ER. Chris, sorry, man. We, we don't know what's wrong. We're going to send you to the hospital and you know, run more tests. So they go to the hospital. I have two abscesses on my liver. If you know anything about your liver, you have to have it. And while I was in the hospital, I had also gotten pneumonia. So they had a big chest tube. If you've ever seen those things, they're real thick. I had one going right here in my side. I had two drains right here going in, in my a liver. I had an IV in each arm sick. So the doctor walks in, Chris, man, can't figure this out. Don't know what's going on. We've only had two cases of it. There was a nine-year-old girl and there was you. The nine-year-old the nine girl died. I was in the room laying on the hospital bed when the doctor walked in and looked at my parents and said, we're not sure if he's able to make it through. We don't know what to do. But you know, there's something about, about prayer. When man says something is impossible, God says it's possible. <laughs> about day 23, I'm in the hospital room. Sorry about day 24. My dad's in the back corner of my room shouting in the middle of the hospital where he didn't care if anybody heard him because he knew that no doctor, no physician was going to be able to do this. If my son was going to be healed, it had to be through the miracle working power of Jesus Christ. So he stood back in the back room, not caring about anything, and jumped up and shouted and screamed. All of the nurses down the hall didn't know what was happening. He was back there just spinning around, just jumping up, saying, God, heal my son. God, heal my son. Because he got to that point in his life where he was desperate. He was desperate for God to come through. So here's what happened at about midnight. It seriously was. I'm not making that up. It was at midnight. 
God woke this lady up in her sleep. Somebody we didn't know. Woke her up. Her son actually played offensive line for the University of Alabama, drafted in the first round, played with the Washington Redskins. Woke her up, said there's a pastor's kid at this hospital, on this floor, in this room. You need to wake up, get dressed, hop in your car, drive there. You need to pray with him tonight. So what did she do? She woke up, she got dressed, she hopped in her car, she drove to the hospital, went up to the right floor, to the right room. Are you a pastor's kid? Yes, I need to pray with you. God sent me here to pray with you. She prayed for me. My dad was in the back corner of the room praying. She had her hand over me praying. That next morning, see, I hadn't eaten in over 23 days. I was down to 150 pounds. I looked sick. I couldn't eat. The pain was so bad. So much so that I looked at my mom and said, Mom, trust me, I'm saved. I'll go to heaven. Just pull the plug. I'm fine. I told her that. But I had a mama that prayed too. And when that lady laid her hands down on me, it's like my body just felt warm. I woke up that next morning, stood up, walked around the hospital, ate some food, was dressed in the next week, and I got in a car and went home. Because God said, in response to your prayer, I'll perform a miracle. In response to the prayer, prayer heals the purpose of prayer is to become intimate with God and to minister to Him because He longs for us to be with Him, to know Him. We were created for this purpose to be in communion with God. Prayer allows us to fulfill His purpose in our life. It goes even farther beyond that because, you see, the one thing about Jesus that I love so much is He didn't just tell you what to do. He actually showed you what to do. And the Bible goes over and over multiple times. I could sit here all day and just list, list, list of all the times that the Bible says Jesus was alone in prayer. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus was over and over alone by himself. He fasted for 40 days. Listen, there are people in the Bible that prayed when they saw great things happen. When Joshua prayed, the sun stood still. There were Amorite armies coming after him. But he said, you know what, God, you have already promised me the victory. So I'm going to say, you know what, no matter, I'm going to say, son, stand still. He had the faith. He didn't want the sun to go down. Read the Bible. It says, and it says the sun stood still. In response to his prayer, when Elijah prayed, it rained down fire from heaven. When Jesus prayed, the dead rose to life. When the church prayed, an angel drug Peter out of jail. When Hezekiah prayed, his life was extended. And when Hannah prayed, God gave her a child. What happens when you pray? Do miracles take place? Does the supernatural take place? Or does God say, I'm not going to give you the candy until you've done the chore? Because there's things we got to do first in order to get what God really has for us. Put the action behind your faith. When the New Testament church prayed, God shook the whole building. And Acts tells us that they had the power to witness like never before. Why? They prayed. They responded. They acted. God did it. We mistake the purpose of prayer sometimes as a, just a little more uh, than a means of persuading God to grant whatever we want him to. This is why when Jesus instructs us to pray, he has us pray, thy will be done before anything else. Because at the end of the day, it's not what we want, but rather what he wants for us. You see, God's always going to answer your prayer. It might not be the answer you want to hear, but he's going to answer it. But it's always the answer that he wants you to have. You see, there's a thing that I learned about prayer. The Bible tells us in Matthew, Jesus teaches us again to pray. He says, when you pray, don't be like those hypocrites because they just like to hear, the, hear themselves. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It goes on to say that this is how you pray. It says, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who, uh, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, God will forgive you. Here's what that teaches me about prayer. 
The P in prayer stands for praise. Because the first thing you do is you always give praise to God. Thank you so much for how awesome you are. Thank you for dying on that cross for me. You didn't have to, God, but thank you. You're so awesome. Give him praise. The R in prayer stands for repent because after you've given him praise, God's not going to do what, he's, what he wants to do in your life until you have given him everything. You repent. The A in prayer is ask because you've given him the praise. You've repented for your sins and now you can ask God for what you need. I love the Y because the Y stands for yield because it's his will, not my will. The E is expect. Because do you not know that when you pray, you have to expect God to come through? There has to be an expectation every time you walk into this church service that God's going to do something. There has to be an expectancy in your heart when you pray for a need that you have that God is going to come through. Praise, repent, ask, yield, expect. The R is rest. Because you know why? Because God's got it. <laughs> when you rest, though, that's hard. It's hard. And here's why. You might have somebody that you love that's not saved. You've prayed, you've prayed, you've prayed. They're still not back in church. You've done all that you think that you can Here's what God says. If you do what you're supposed to, if you do what you can, I'll do what you can't. And if we rest in God, God's got this. He's got this. You might be here this morning and say, I'm struggling through something right now. I'm going through something hard. I've tried everything that I know to try. I just can't seem to get it right. Rest in God. He's got it. You might be here this morning and says, I've got too much bills at the end of my month. I don't have the money to pay them. Rest. God's got it. You might think, God can't forgive me. I've already done too much wrong. Let me tell you something. The cross represented more than what you will ever go through. The cross represented more than what you've been through. And the cross represents more than what you'll ever have to go through. The cross is all that we need. Rest. God's got it. You might be here this morning and say, Pastor Chris, I'm sick. I need healing. Rest, because God's got it. And if there's nothing else to pray for, pray for this church. Pray for the pastor. Pray for the staff. Pray for the people. Why? Because God hit me last night as I was praying, and he said, Chris, Northport's on the verge of something awesome. And if my people will make prayer a priority, there is nothing in hell that can stop what God is going to do. And I believe that. Do you believe that? I believe that. And that's from the kids' ministry to the youth ministry to the music. In every ministry of this church, God's got this. If you'll stand. If you're here this morning, you said, Pastor Chris, I'm one of those people that you just named. I need, I need God in my life. I need to make prayer a priority. Then Pastor Kyle is about to sing, and I invite you to come up here and pray. Because there's no better time to start than right now. If that's you, please come.